Welcome to Antelope Valley Adventist Church. We welcome you from near and far, and we just want to say happy Sabbath. I would love to tell you our mission statement here at Antelope Valley Adventist Church. It is to love God, connect with each other, and to serve our community. We hope you can enjoy this sermon and have a wonderful day. God bless. Happy Sabbath, church family. I have a couple of announcements that you guys should be informed about. Sabbath school quarterlies can be picked up between the hours of 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. If you wanna drop off your tithes and offering, you can do so between that time on Wednesdays. If you prefer to give your tithes and offering online, you can visit the site adventistgiving.org. If you have not done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Antelope Valley SEA, so that you will be notified when we are live. Prayer meeting is every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. We have an important board meeting coming up August 2nd, and the information with that link will be sent out closer to the date. Today at 4 p.m., we have a pastor's dialogue, and that link will be sent out this afternoon by Sister Denise. 
communion information will be announced next Sabbath, so make sure that you tune in to our live services to get that information. With that being said, enjoy your Sabbath. All the villagers raced to the airstrip, singing and dancing when mission pilot Gary Roberts landed at Saminka, a remote village in the Indonesian province of Papua. It had taken the villagers 10 years to cut down the trees by hand to clear the way for an airstrip at their mountainous village. And Gary's mission plane was the first to land. This was a big event. As Gary stepped out of the plane, the crowd grew silent. Their singing and dancing stopped. Is this a Seventh-day Adventist plane? A man asked. The villagers had seen the Three Angels logo on the airplane's tail. Gary was surprised. Saminka was a village previously accessible only by a long trek by foot, so he hadn't expected the villagers to have heard about the Adventist church. The villagers soon told him that many of them were keeping the Sabbath. The reason, they said, was because of a Seventh-day Adventist dog. The story started several years earlier, just across the border in Papua New Guinea, when an Adventist pastor named Moses and a lay pastor named Darius had the same dream on the same night. In the morning, one said, I had a dream last night. The other said, I did too, but I didn't want to tell you. They both had seen an angel in the dream, and the angel said, go to Saminka. A few days later, the two men set off on the three-day hike to Saminka. Arriving at the village, they announced evangelistic meetings would be held every evening for a week under a tree on the far side of the village. But by the day of the first meeting, Pastor Moses fell ill with malaria. He was terribly sick, and the villagers predicted that he would die. But if he gets better, then we will listen to him at the meeting, they said. All day, Pastor Moses was sick, but at 5 p.m., he suddenly felt better. He took a bath and preached. Afterward, he fell very ill again. This happened all week. He was sick until 5 p.m., recovered, took a bath, and preached. Then he sank back into bed. At the meetings, he told the people about the Sabbath and cautioned against eating unclean meat such as pork. Wild pigs are a popular dish in the Papua Mountains. When the week ended, Pastor Moses made an appeal, but no one came forward. Pastor Moses and Darius returned home deeply disappointed. They wondered why they had had the dream without any results. Back in Suminka, life resumed as normal until Saturday morning. The village's best hunting dog, Dolby, got up and headed down the trail. His owner and other villagers thought he was onto something, so they followed. Dolby went to the tree where the missionary had spoken and sat down. The villagers thought that was strange. The next Saturday, Dolby did the same thing. He got up, walked over to the tree, and sat down. He refused to hunt on Saturdays. The villagers had noticed that Dolby had stopped eating pork, too. He refused to hunt for wild pigs and other unclean animals. Dolby has become a Seventh-day Adventist, one villager said. If he worships on Sabbath, we should too, said another. Many villagers began to keep the Sabbath and stopped eating unclean foods. Gary, the mission pilot, was so excited when he heard the story, and he later called Pastor Moses. The pastor was some distance away from Suminka, so he contacted Darius and told him to plan on spending a year at the village, teaching the people about Bible truths. Today, about half of the village of 200 adults and children worship on Sabbath, and 21 people have been baptized. Dolby still doesn't eat unclean food. The villagers say he is a very healthy dog. Good morning, church. <clears throat> I just wanted to give an intercessory prayer for this morning. Um, close your eyes and bow your heads. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you first for just waking us up this morning and giving us another day, giving us another Sabbath, another Saturday, dear Heavenly Father, to get it right and to get closer to you, dear Heavenly Father, and to perfect what you want us to be, dear Heavenly Father. I ask that you be with those that are sick and shut in, dear Heavenly Father. You know who they are. I ask that you bless their body, you heal their body, and keep those around them safe and protected, dear Heavenly Father. I wanna thank you for keeping everyone safe that are out of town or visiting other loved ones, dear Heavenly Father. I ask for traveling mercies that you bring them home safely and take them where they're going safely, dear Heavenly Father. I ask that you continue to be a blessing and a beacon in everyone's heart and in our mind, dear Heavenly Father. And I ask that we continue to follow your word, dear Heavenly Father, follow your will, dear Heavenly Father, and do your will. I ask that you be with those that are <clears throat> struggling with work and finances, dear Heavenly Father, or schooling or living arrangements and situations. I ask that you be with them, you guide them, you comfort them, dear Heavenly Father, and let them know that it's not over and that you are still protecting them, dear Heavenly Father. I ask for the rest of the day to be peaceful and restful for those that are taking in the Sabbath, dear Heavenly Father, and for those that aren't even. I ask that we can be a witness to someone out there and give our own testimony to show your greatness, dear Heavenly Father. And all these things I ask in Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. The sound of a mighty Russian wind, and it's close now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet as Gabriel sounds the call, the call at the midnight goodbye. Go home. I look around me, I see prophecies fulfilling, fulfilling, and signs of the times. They're appearing everywhere, everywhere. I can almost see the Father saying, Child, go tell my children, go and warn my children that at the midnight cry. We'll be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise. Prophecies 
fulfilling, fulfilling, and signs of the times, they're appearing everywhere, everywhere, I can almost hear the Father saying, child, go tell my children, better go and warn my children, that at the midnight cry, we'll be going home. When Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children, the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. And then those that remain, they shall be quickly changed, quickly changed, changed. In a moment, at the midnight cry. Ooh, at the midnight cry. At the midnight cry. When Jesus steps out. His children, the dead in Christ, shall rise to meet him in the air. And those that remain, they shall be quickly change, quickly change, change in a moment, at the midnight cry, ooh, at the midnight cry, at the midnight cry, we'll be gone. Amen, amen, amen. At the midnight cry, at the midnight cry. Happy Sabbath. Church family, so good to be with you here again on this beautiful Holy Sabbath day as we transition once again, once again. If you notice I'm not standing up, I am sitting down, relaxing. And so uh, we're gonna have a good time in God's word today as we continue on in the book of Revelation. Let's open up with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much just for being so good to us. Lord, we thank you so much for promising us that at the midnight cry, when you call your saints to come forward, our prayer, God, is that we will be a part of that number. But we thank you so much for giving us that opportunity to choose you, O oh Father, even as you have chosen us. Lord, we have had a long week. Some of us, we've had a difficult week, a trying week, but we're here today. You have sustained us. You have kept us, protected us, provided food, clothes, shelter over our heads, oh God. And for that, we simply say, thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you so much for being our friend. Thank you so much for providing us your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, Lord, for uh, giving your holy angels 
to guard over our lives in our comings and in our goings. Now, O oh Lord, as we continue to study the book of Revelation, we ask you for your divine wisdom. We ask you, God, for your divine help. My prayer, God, is that you will remove all of the scales from our eyes and that we will be able to see, O oh Lord, what you see and that we will go even deeper in our walk with you. Lord, we ask you for forgiveness of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please settle our emotions, settle our conscience, Lord, whatever anxiety or worries that we may have so that, Lord, we can experience the fullness of Jesus Christ. In this moment, we pray, amen, amen, and amen. So good to be with you, those of you watching on YouTube from California to New York to Florida, all over. We praise God for your presence. You know, over the last uh, seven Sabbaths, we spent journeying through Asia Minor at the seven churches, and we were able to glean the strengths and weaknesses of these churches on earth. But something strange happened in Revelation chapter four. We have this abrupt, I call it, transition from the city and church of Laodicea to heaven, from earth to heaven. We have this rough, in my opinion, transition. And we're going to look at Revelation chapter four and figure out what is taking place. But I want to give you some insight uh, into what we're going to look at and what I believe is the theme of Revelation chapter four. Four sights, four sights that the apostle John beheld, number one, he beheld the throne of God in Revelation chapter four. Number two, John beheld God himself sitting on his throne. And number three, John beheld 24 elders and these four creatures around the throne. And number four, John beheld several activities taking place around the throne. Revelation chapter four gives us the theme of a throne. And so the title of this message is the throne room trailer, throne room trailer. Go with me to Revelation chapter four and it will also be on the screen. Reading out of the new King James version of the Bible. The word of God tells us this, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. The, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who had sat there was like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were, the Bible says, 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robe and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in the back, scary. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Verse eight, the four living creatures, each having six wings were full of eyes around and within and they do not rest day or night saying, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. 
So they're praising God. They're worshiping God constantly, John C. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you are, you created all things and by your will, they exist and were created. Look at all the adoration, adulation that they're giving to our Lord Jesus Christ. And here the Bible tells us that they are so caught up emotionally that they're just giving God glory. They can't even contain themselves physically. They're worshiping God. The Bible says they're throwing their crowns at the feet, at the throne of our God, our Savior. So then, the throne of God, God himself on the throne, the creatures who surrounds the throne and the activities that take place around the throne. The Bible declares in Revelation chapter four, verse one, after these things, after what things? The seven churches that John beheld, that John journeyed through, the Bible tells us that God takes them into the heavens. Uh, so he moves from earth to heaven. After these things, the Bible says, I look, John says, and I behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So here, this is what I want you to get just as we start this study. The Bible tells us that God opens up a door and John sees that this door is open and the voice tells John, come up because I have something else to show you. If you recall, last week we talked about the door, God closing doors, God opening doors. How do we know that God is leading us in our lives? How do we know when God is leading the church as a group collectively, corporately? It is through one way, through doors that's, that opens up and doors uh, that are closed. Oftentimes we are afraid to walk through doors because we are fearful of the unknown. Fear simply means false evidence appearing real false evidence appearing real. We fear the unknown, therefore we do not take risks for God. And when we don't take a risk for God, guess what? God will never take risks for us. And therefore our testimonies will continuously be dry because we are not moving by faith, but we are more so moving by our own futile wisdom and intellect and education and experience and by sight and not by faith. And I want to encourage us believers that we must begin to walk by faith and not by sight. You can have a hundred million questions about something, but it takes faith to step out to see what God is going to do. And when God opens up the door, it behooves us to move forward by faith and stepping out by faith so that we can see the windows of heaven open up. Yes. And so here the Bible tells us a door opens up and God is beckoning John to step through the door. You see church, if we don't move by faith, we will remain in the same place for the next 20, 30 years. And so I want to encourage you, let's have faith. Let's trust God. You know, you can have a hundred million questions and still you're not satisfied with all of the answers. You know why? Because you have little faith. And I want to encourage you that when God says step forward, when God opens up a door that no man can open up or could never open up, have faith. Maybe it's God speaking because if it's not God's will, my friends, God will close that door. He will close that door. And so here the Bible tells us 
that John steps through, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, the Bible says that John sees this throne set in heaven. Notice the verbiage. He sees this throne set in heaven. The key, the throne of God, the key and destiny and fate of, our, of everything that happens to us in this life is wrapped up in our understanding of the throne of God, wrapped up in our concept of the understanding of the throne, okay? Everything. The throne in Revelation chapter four is key to Revelation chapter four. It is key to our understanding and what God is trying to tell us even today in 2020. July, as we move into the month of August. In fact, if you read with sensitive eyes and carefully, you will discover from verse one to the last verse of Revelation chapter four, the word throne is written 14 times. How many times did I say? 14 times. What is 14 times? What does that mean? We know numbers mean something in scripture. We know that seven represents completion, seven represents perfection, seven represents uh, in, infallible, seven represents to the infinity. So imagine seven times seven, right? 14 times, right? 14 times to the infinity, 14 times. It's telling us something, my friends. God is trying to reiterate the power of his throne. He's signaling a message in this very word throne. Yes. So it occurs 14 times in the chapter of four, and it is central to everything that takes place in this chapter. It is the theme of Revelation chapter four. It stands in the heavenly throne room as an expression and symbol of God's sovereignty, of God's authority, and of God's majesty. We're talking about the throne, the first point. The first sight that John beholds is the throne. All things are oriented around the throne of God. John sees one, the Bible says, who actually sits on the throne. And he sees uh, 24 thrones and 24 elders who are seated around the throne of God. So there are thrones that surround the throne of God. Are you with me? So then, he sees also these precious jewels around the throne. He sees lightning proceeding from the throne. He, he hears thundering. He sees a sea of glass like crystal and fire burning before the throne. And he sees creatures in the midst of the throne. All things are oriented around the throne of God. I'm excited today because we're gonna learn something about the throne. Think about the waves of diseases and viruses that have plagued humanity, uh, especially God's children. Think about hunger, think about cancer, think about uh, 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 mad cow disease, pneumonia, SARS, smallpox, tuberculosis, malaria, COVID-19. Think about the natural phenomenons of our world, natural disasters such as hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis and earthquakes. Think about the violence in our society, robberies, murderers, unjust brutality and racism. In fact, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter six, uh, under the sixth seal, the fifth seal rather, the Bible tells us that, that John sees a group of martyrs who represent those who were part of the Reformation period. And they're crying out, Lord, how long, how long uh, will you go? And how long will we be persecuted before you finally respond? And this is happening around the throne. The throne is very aware of what's happening in our world today. Think about the unjust laws and abuse of power, all of which do not happen without the presence of the heavenly throne. The beautiful belief is that 
we don't des- we don't serve a theist God. We don't serve a God that created the world but left us to ourselves. We don't serve a God that remains indifferent to the universe. Praise God for that. But we serve a God who is intricately involved in the affairs of life. A God who allows and does not permit. We serve a God who who is present to all of the good and all of the woes of this world. This throne was a set throne in heaven, the Bible says. It was set in heaven. It was set in this room. When everything in this life is unstable, when everything in this life is, is shaky, on shaky grounds, when everything in this life is muddy and soft, fragile, futile, fickle, from human behavior to positions, to institutions, to nations, God's kingdom is set. God's kingdom is stable. God's kingdom is firm. God's kingdom is durable. I heard someone say this before. The only constant in life is change. That is the only constant in life. And in the last seven months, we have seen nothing but change in our society, change in our community, change in the church, change in our families. In fact, I remember starting this whole entire new way of doing ministry. We started uh, from the prayer line and we transitioned to Zoom and we had people in the church to today, now it's just me in the church. And I'm not standing, but I'm actually sitting relaxing like you, amen somebody. Change, the only constant in life is change. And as long as we're in this world, we will constantly experience change. And when we can understand the concept of change and it will put things in perspective as a believer and understand that even our God who never changes, we can trust in him in the midst of all kinds of changes in our lives, which will decrease our stress system decrease our anxiety, decrease the fears that we have, knowing that we serve a God who will one day eradicate the changes that take place in this world. Amen. And so get used to it, my friends. I know some of you are anxious. Some of you want to get back to church. Some of you, you, you're impatient. You're getting sick and tired of COVID-19. There are people in the world who don't know God and they are on the verge of suicide because they cannot deal with the changes that's taking place. In fact, it was recorded that when the stock market crashed in 1929, a whole lot of people committed suicide in one day because so many people in that time, they lost so much and they could not deal with the change. But imagine if you are a believer in God, no matter what happens in your life, friends may leave, family may die or move away, the body may become afflicted, change is imperative. And we must understand that if we have God in us, he will see us through every circumstance because he is the one who anchors us through the storms of life. It is God and it is God alone. For the Bible declares in Psalm, the 45th chapter, verse six, your throne, O God, God, is forever and ever and ever. God's throne is set in heaven, the Bible says. But then John beholds, or he beholds something else. He beheld God himself who sits on his throne. For the first part of the second part of Verse two tells us this in Revelation chapter four, verse two, and one sat on the throne and one sat on the throne. You see, my friends, when a ruler took his seat on the throne, he had royal power. He had a scepter in his hand and and he was considered the ruler. Him sitting on a throne or his scepter in his hand, it was a symbolism of his rulership and power over his territory and over the people and over his army. Oftentimes, I wonder who is on the throne of our hearts when things don't go the way we plan them. Who is occupying our minds? 
Who is responsible for our behaviors when things don't go as we want them to go? In every successive generation, God has always had someone from humanity to behold his throne in heaven, to remind humanity that he is a God who sits high, but he looks low, and that his foundation is unshakable from Moses to the prophet Micaiah, who claimed uh, that he saw the Lord sitting on the throne and all of the hosts uh, in heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. So here Micaiah tells us that he saw God sitting on his throne. Uh, to Isaiah, uh, another prophet who saw the Lord sitting on a throne lofty and exhaust, exalted in majesty to Daniel who saw God sitting on the throne which saw God ablaze with flames its wheel burning fire I'm giving you scriptures uh, witnesses where God's men they saw God sitting on his throne even to Ellen White close to our generation who witnessed three groups in heaven. She witnessed the first group, the 144,000 who stood around his throne in a perfect square. And then she saw a second group, uh, the martyrs wearing purple who stood around the 144,000 in a perfect square. But then she saw the great multitude, which no man or no woman could number, standing around the 144,000 and the martyrs around the throne of God. My friends, I'm here to tell you in the 21st century, God sits on his throne and he sees everything that is going on. Nothing misses God. He sees it all, my friends. Yes, Revelation chapter four shows us that God is in control. That's why we ought not to fear. That's why we ought not to allow our anxiety to get the best of us. That's why we ought not to ruminate over the past or worry about the future, but we must learn to be in the here and now, learn to be in the present, learn to practice breathing techniques that can slow down and calm our brain, that emotional center of our brain. We must learn these simple naturopathic remedies and techniques that God has given mankind to help deal with our worries. When Jesus says, why take thought in tomorrow? Let's consider what's happening in the moment. Yes, God is in control, my friends. The president of the United States of America is not in control. The CDC is not in control. Congress is not in control. The United States Supreme Court is not in control. The military, the different political parties, the elites of the world, the three percenters, the Freemasonry, the what some consider the black pope uh, or the pope of the Catholic church are not in control. God is the one that hold the keys to life, God and God alone. And my friends, I'm here to tell you, God has given his children the keys. Yes. So John sees this throne and John sees God who is sitting on the throne. But John attempts to describe what God looks like. The Bible declares in Revelation chapter four, verse three, watch this. He who sat was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, right? And there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. So here, this is interesting because John is peeking back off of what Ezekiel saw. Now you must understand this, that 404 verses out of 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 
Revelation contains 404 verses. 270 verses are direct allusions of the Old Testament. And so here, John, he sees what Ezekiel saw in vision in Ezekiel chapter one and, and several chapters throughout the book of Ezekiel. He sees God riding in, on his chariot, chariots representing his angels, and he, and he beholds the color of God, these various jewels and gems and precious rubies. He beholds uh, these things. And John in Revelation, he sees the same thing that Ezekiel sees. God's colors, God's image, God's, God's nature, the appearance of what God looks like. Huh? Both John and Ezekiel witnessed many colors around the presence of God. Listen, my friends, if we are made in the image of God and God likes diversity, God likes diversity because if God did not like diversity, we would not have all the nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. So God likes diversity. Look at nature. God likes diversity. Look at the exotic creatures in the, in the wildlife. God likes diversity. So if we were made in the image of God and God likes diversity, in fact, his very presence is diversified. Amen, somebody. Then the different races, the different tongues, the different nations, the different kindreds, and the different people are simply reflection of God's image. So then, if that stands correct, if that stands true, this whole fight over white versus black, white, whites are superior over blacks, all of these distractions is simply Satan trying to invalidate the diversified image of God, because part of God's very being, part of his essence, are the many colors that we saw and that we know about in the rainbow and what Noah experienced. We serve a God who is a God of many colors. Are you with me today, my friends? And as one preacher said it, best, racism, is when a human hates another human being. So you can actually be a racist against people of your own race or color because it's simply a hatred towards another group of person or people or persons. In fact, the rainbow around his presence and throne speaks to the covenant God made with Noah that he would never destroy the world again with flood. It speaks to his protection. It speaks to, to his mercy, his heart of giving mankind a second chance. John is getting a sneak peek into the very heart of our God. John beheld the throne of God, God himself, but he is also, but he also beheld creatures around God's throne. You know, I remember going to a basketball game a couple years ago. In fact, it's called the Big Three by O'Shea Jackson, better known as Ice Cube. And, and, and my family and I, we went to a game, one of the games, and we were sitting almost on the floor. And an hour into the game, comes walking in to the Staples Center, Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg, he walks in with about 20 people, his entourage, 20 crew people. And, you know, Snoop Dogg is not a short guy. He's pretty tall. But the people that walked in with Snoop Dogg, they were just as tall, if not taller and bigger than Snoop Dogg at the Staples Center. These guys were twice his size. Everybody stood up. Everybody moved their eyeballs from the basketball court to Snoop Dogg, everything stopped. I say all that to say this, when God moves, everything stops. When God speaks, all of heaven is silent. When God comes the second time, all, all of the earth will mourn and stop when God comes. You know, I remember going to another game. This was 
the Laker game. And it was one of the last games Kobe Bryant was at. And he came with his daughter, the one who died in a crash with him, Gigi. And I remember, and they show this clip all the time with him sitting at, at on court side with his daughter. And I was at that game. And, and, and I remember when he stood up and he was getting ready to leave, they stopped the game out of respect to the great Kobe Bryant. And the announcer got on a speaker and said, everybody, please rise to your feet as Kobe Bryant one of the greatest Lakers ever is leaving the building. And everybody stood up and started clapping, including all of the Lakers, including LeBron James, including the players, uh, the Atlanta Hawk players who were at that game playing against the Los Angeles Lakers. Everybody stood and paused as they were clapping. And as Kobe was leaving, he was just waving goodbye to everyone as he walked out of the, the, the gym uh, graciously out of the arena graciously. But imagine when Jesus comes back again, all of the world will stop. In fact, the Bible tells us all of heaven will be silent for space of a half hour as God comes back to take his loved ones home with him. We serve a God who does not withdraw himself. Hear me closely, my friends. We serve a God that does not like living in isolation. We serve a God who is social, a God who is engaged with his children, even when they're not acting right. We oftentimes withdraw from God's children. But when we act bad, God, he rushes over towards us because he loves us so much and he wants to do everything he can to save us. That's the kind of God that we serve. We serve a God who is socially active with his people. We serve a God who is socially competent. We serve a God who is not socially inept. We serve a God who enjoys being around his creatures and his creation. Yes, we serve a God who not only likes to be around his angels, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but we serve a God who likes to be with fallen humanity. And we ought to be the same way too. In fact, when Jesus was on earth, who did Jesus hang with? the publicans, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, the Pharisees. He even hung out with the Pharisees, Simon the Pharisee, Nicodemus. Jesus hung out with everybody, even when they treated him bad. We do the reverse. When we get uncomfortable, when people make us uncomfortable, when things don't go the way we want them to go, we tend to withdraw and isolate ourselves. When Jesus is telling us, that is the time we need to draw strength from each other, draw warmth where there is coldness in our world today. My friends, let's not go into our isolated corners in this COVID-19 era. Now is the time to come together. Now is the time that we need each other. You are as strong as your weakest link and we need each other. The pastor need you, you need the pastor. The deacon needs you, the elder needs you, the usher needs you, our seniors need you. We all need each other. We serve a God that when he travels, he travels with his posse. Yes, and the Bible declares he's coming again. And when he comes again, he's coming with an infinite number of his angels. All of heaven will be empty and the earth will light up, the Bible says. Re it will remove itself out of its place, the Bible says, in Revelation chapter six. Earth will be shaking at its core when Jesus comes again. When he comes, the Bible declares, my friends, all will confess, all will bow. Land animals, sea creatures, the fowls of the air, all will recognize that he is the prince of princesses, yes, he is the king of royal dignitaries. He is the minister of all prime ministers. He is the president of all presidents. He is the secretary of state of all secretaries and ambassadors around the world. Every knee will bow, the Bible says. Every tongue will confess. Buddha will confess. Mohammed will confess. Krishna will con confess. The Dalai Lama will con confess. The founder of Taoism, Laozi, will confess. Joseph Smith will confess. 
Every black man will confess. Every white man will confess. Every police officer will confess. Every politician will confess. Every straight man will confess. Every gay man will confess. Every lesbian will confess. Every heterosexual, every transsexual will confess. Every believer, every unbeliever will confess that he is Lord. Yes, I can't wait for that day, my friends. So why not confess now? Why not? The Bible declares, as we move along, in verse four of Revelation chapter four, the Bible tells us around the throne were 24 thrones, plural, thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting on these thrones. And they were clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Listen, my friends. God will be the one to put the gold on us. Amen, somebody. When he created Adam and Eve, he created Adam and Eve in his image. And what lit them up was God's presence and God's glory. But since sin, we have been trying to light ourselves up. We have been trying to add to God's creation and add to God's image. But did you know, my friends, when God comes back, the Bible tells us in Malachi that the earth will burn up, or the fervent elements will burn up, the gold of this life will burn up, the gold that we love to put on ourselves will burn up. So why not take it off if it's going to burn up? And let's let God adorn us. Let God adorn you with his beauty, with his love, with his peace. That is true beauty. Beauty is skin deep. Beauty is not what you see when you look at Mr. T. Beauty is what you see when someone is reflecting the very character of Jesus Christ. Beauty is what Jesus had when he was on this earth. Jesus uh, did not put it on himself. And Jesus, he will put it on us when we get to heaven. So we don't need to put it on ourselves. That's just a little side note. But who are these elders? Who are these elders? First of all, let me tell you who they're not. These elders are not angels, as some may believe. Because angels, they're never called elders in the Holy Bible. And you won't find that even in Jewish literature. No, you won't. Angels are never described as sharing God's throne. In fact, the Bible declares all those who overcome will sit with him on his throne. We don't never find a place in scripture where it says angels sit with God on his throne. No, no, no. But rather angels, they stand in the presence of God. But here the Bible declares that God's children and these 24 elders, they are sitting on God's throne. And the Bible says that anyone who overcomes, as we learned last week, they will sit with God on his throne. So we know that angels are not called elders, and angels, are they don't sit on God's throne. Number three, angels don't really wear white, as we have seen in pictures and how we've described them to look and be. In fact, the white garment that we find in this passage, the white garment symbolizes the faithful people of God on planet Earth. The white garment consistently refers to God's faithful people. In fact, go with me, and you don't have this on the screen, so just go with me to Revelation chapter 3. Let me show you some passages. In Revelation chapter 3, and notice what the Bible says in verse 4, speaking about that dead church Sardis, it says this, you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy, right? So notice the Bible says they have not defiled their garments. He who overcomes shall be clothed in what? White garments. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. So here the Bible says, that those who overcome will be found wearing white garment. Let's look at verse 18. The Bible says, I counsel you to buy me gold refined in fire, 
that you may be rich and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. So here, the Bible tells us that white garment represents clothing from shame. Okay, let's look at another passage, Revelation chapter 6. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. The Bible says, then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. So here the Bible says, when they died in Jesus, they were sealed with a white garment. White garment simply means character, character, character. And I can give you more scriptures. We can go on and on and on. But the point here is this. White garment represents the character of Jesus Christ that God's children on earth are manifesting to all of the world's unfallen and the unfallen world, the earth, that is. Number four, the elders wear golden crowns. There is nowhere in scripture where it says angels wear crowns. There is nowhere in scripture where it says angels wear crowns of victory. If you study the Greek language, in the Greek, crown, in this context, it comes from a Greek word, stephanos, which means victory, uh, which simply means you have overcome something. Now, there are two main Greek words for crown. In the English, we just have crown. But in the Greek, we have a variation. And this is the advantage of studying the original language. So you have diadem and you have royal. Diadem, diadem rather, and Stephanus. Diadem represents royalty. So when Jesus comes back again, the Bible says in Revelation, and he has a crown on his head, that crown is not a Stephanus crown. It's not a victory crown. It's a crown of royalty. It's a crown of power that he is king of kings and lord of lords. But in this context, the Bible says these elders are wearing a crown. This is Stephanus in the Greek language. That's how it's written in Stephanus. It's Greek, which means a crown of victory, meaning signifying that God's children, they overcame something. The 24 elders, they overcame something. Now, a lot of people believe that, and, and I tend to fall in this camp, uh, that the 24 elders also represent those trophies who rose up, who, who were raised out of the grave when Jesus came forth out of the grave and they went back to heaven with him as witnesses. So you have people that believe that and, and I tend to fall in that camp. And these are the 24 elders representing humanity who's worshiping God and they overcame something. Notice the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 19, verse 12, the Bible says his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Now, who is the one with the flame of fire? Who is the one that had many crowns on his single head? Who is the one that did not know what was written on the crown except the man himself. That's Jesus Christ. And in the original language, it doesn't say Stephanus, it says diadem, which is royalty. So here in Revelation chapter four, where the Bible is talking about the 24 elders and they have crowns, that's Stephanus, that's victory because they overcame something. So these 24 elders represent humanity, not angels. In fact, the Bible tells us in First Thessalonians, because, you know, for Stephanus, you have many names or many associations that's attached to this victory crown. For example, First Thessalonians, you can write this down. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. The Bible declares, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Notice, crown of rejoicing. So, a victory crown is also called a crown of rejoicing. And why are they rejoicing? They are rejoicing because they overcame by the blood of the lamb. And now they're able to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. The passage continues this way. It is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ as it, at, at his coming. Let me, let me read that again. Is it not even you? in the presence of our Lord 
Jesus Christ at his coming. Notice the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain an incorruptible crown. But we, are, I'm sorry, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we do it for an incorruptible crown. So number one, you have a crown of rejoicing, but you also have an incorruptible crown. Let me give you another one. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, the apostle Paul calls it the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. So you have the crown of rejoicing. You have the incorruptible crown. And you have the crown of righteousness. And you have several other passages where different names are given for the victory crown. And these 24 elders, my friends, are those who gained victory. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. But then John noticed a different set of species in Revelation chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says in verse 6. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and in the back. The first living was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third like the face of a man, and the fourth like a flying eagle. John sees the same creatures Ezekiel witnessed, and they're always in proximity to the throne of God. God does not change his posse. God does not change his crew. When God moves, his entourage moves with him. What are they doing? They're worshiping. Can I just pause? Let me back up. I got to back up. Because I said something. Wherever God moves, they move with him. You know, in light of this COVID-19, I have a question to ask you. Are we moving together as a church? Are we moving together as Christians around the world? Are we moving together as a family in light of COVID-19? Or are we separate? Are we going here and are we going there? Are we abandoning the church that God has called you to be a part of? Do you know someone who is abandoning the church that God has called them to be a part of? Because what we find in this chapter is God never changes. The four living creatures that we see in Revelation, we find in Ezekiel. But we have added information the 24 elders, which came about after Jesus went to heaven. And John is seeing this post the time of Ezekiel. We must be together, my friends. Together we stand, divided we fall. We must have a united front. We must have one voice. God is not asking for uniformity. God is asking for unity and we must be united. How can we win the world if we're not united? And when we're not united, Satan is winning. Satan has the victory. But the Bible declares, John beholds, John he sees that they are worshiping God. They are singing praises to God and they're singing in the present and they're singing in the future. John he's seeing this in the first century and they're singing in his present but they're singing in our time. And we will be with them singing when we get to heaven. And John, he is, he is seeing all of this. What else is happening around the throne? The Bible declares that there is lightning around this throne. There is thundering around this throne. Voices around this throne. The Bible declares seven lamps of fire burning before the throne and seven spirits of God surrounding the throne. This is the greatest celebration ever. There is no party like a party in heaven, my friends. 
Listen. Shh. Don't say nothing. Notice. They're not quiet in his presence. They're not silent in the presence of God even in his very presence and throne room, John is invited into the throne room of God. And there is a huge celebration, my friends. This is why we come to church. We come to church to shout hallelujah because God, you protected me from COVID this week. God, you protected me from car accidents this week. God, you protected me from being murdered this week. God, you protected me from, from, from all of the bad things that could have happened to me in this world. God, you saved me. God, I have a clean bill of health. God, even in my foolishness, you protected me, God. And so I'm going to shout holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come, holy, holy, holy. They are singing praises to God because they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. My friends, we ought to declare praises in the presence of God. Oh, my friends, how can you keep silent in the presence of God when he's done so much for you? The Bible declares they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. You are worthy, Revelation 4 says, O oh Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, the Bible says, and by your will they exist and were created. Notice John spends time under inspiration, writing under inspiration how they are praising God. Yes, my friends. Yes, they're praising God. And let me tell you, you all know if you live in the Antelope Valley area in California, there was a, a murder that took place across the street from this church last week, Wednesday after 1 a.m. in the morning. And I drove, as I was driving, toward the church down Avenue I, I saw several deputies passing by and I arrived at the church 6 a.m. in the morning, Wednesday morning, I arrived 6 a.m. and I saw the yellow tape around the gas station where this young lady was murdered. And I didn't know what had happened until later on that day. And it was on the news and people from the church shared with me who the person was and what happened. But that young lady, when she was shot by two individuals over something stupid, with her, late, her little baby in the back seat of the car, one something in the morning, gunned down on life support, and she died this week, right across the street from where I am in this very moment. We ought to praise God because it could be any one of us. How can you keep silent when God has done so much for you? In fact, did you know that when a baby's born, the most mature development in the brain is the limbic system, which housed the emotional center of the brain. That is why when a baby comes out of the mother's womb, what we see is a baby crying, a baby crying, a baby weeping, not just because the baby is now coming into a new environment, but because that is the only way the baby can express itself, the only way a baby can communicate what's going on inside of it. And even then the baby is doing it automatically unconsciously. We are born as emotional creatures, which means we ought to learn how to connect our emotions with our cognitive state, which means we should never deny our emotions and what we're experiencing. We live in a society where we come down hard on our kids and then we develop it as adults in controlling our emotions. Now we should control our emotions, but understand what I'm saying in context. 
that oftentimes we suppress our emotions when we should not suppress our emotions. And this is one of the things that can quite frankly lead to post-traumatic stress syndrome because we are not connecting the cognitive with our emotions and the neural uh, systems in place that's con that connects the two. Now, I don't wanna get science on you today, but what I am telling you is this, God has given us an emotional system so that we can express ourselves in excitement, but also in sadness, in joy, but also at times in fear, but understanding how to control these emotions we ought to learn. It's called emotional intelligence, emotional regulation. And here the Bible declares that at the right time, they are practicing these emotions and they're blessing God with these emotions. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God no almighty. And not only are they expressing God with, with this marvelous uh, emotional system that God has given them and he's given us. But the Bible declares that they can't even contain these emotions to the point to where they're actually throwing their crowns to the ground, to the feet of our Lord and Savior. Can you see it? Now we have the motor system kicking in because when you're born, the two most developed areas the limbic system, the emotional center of the brain and the motor system. So the baby is moving and the baby is expressing itself. And God has given us these gifts to express ourselves as I'm doing with my hands. <laughs> Amen. You created all things. You created my hands to worship you. You created my mouth to, to bless your holy name. You created my ears that I might hear your Holy Spirit. You created me, oh God. And so I've resigned, A.V., not to worry, not to fret, not to be dismayed, not to sweat because God sits on his throne and I worship him and him alone. If he sits on his throne, then why, as the song says, should I feel discouraged? Why should my heart feel lonely? Why, when Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. I will not stay quiet in his presence. Even if I'm the only one in church, I will preach as if I'm preaching to thousands of people. Yes. Why? Because I sing, the song says, because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know, and I know, and I know, I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know, and I know, and I know, my Jesus, my God, who watches me at night, who watches me in the day, who watches me, I know he watches me now. Yes, my friends, John shows us the trailer uh, that uh, uh, he shows us the trailer of, of the activities going on in the heavenly throne room. God invites John into the throne room of heaven. And now we get a glimpse of what goes on in the presence of God. There is a celebration. There is a party. Inauguration is about to take place that we're going to study on next Sabbath. They are happy. Uh, they are singing. They are praising. Yes, they have their little uh, happy things on their head and the, the thing to blow out of their mouth. They are excited because they are with their Lord and their Savior. I can't wait to be a part of that celebration. And my friends, God, he invites every single one of you to that same celebration. Yes, John, in this trailer, we see the throne of God where nothing passes our Lord and Savior. We see God himself who sits on the throne as our royal king. But we also see the 24 elders who overcame, 
representing humanity. We also see the four creatures that we also find in Ezekiel, in the Old Testament. But we also see all of the activities that take place around this throne. We see lightning. Yes, we see, we hear thundering. We see worship going on. We see crowns being cast to the ground. We see singing and praising. My friends, don't you wanna be a part of that family? Don't you wanna be a part of that celebration? When we won't have to worry about no more separation? I know some of you, you like separation. You're okay with this, with this, with this season that we're in. There's coming a day when God, he's going to gather all of his children. We will never have to worry about separating from each other. Let's get used to it now. Let's draw warmth where there is cold because you are only as strong as your weakest link. The throne room trailer. Just don't watch the movie, be a part of the movie. Get your ticket and be a part of the throne room trailer, amen. Father in heaven, Lord, we bless your holy name. Lord, I'm so excited today because you have shown us a glimpse of the throne room trailer. Everything that we go through in this life, everything that has happened in our world from the beginning of time, from Adam, it has not been missed by your throne, the presence of your throne and the presence of God himself. Lord, thank you so much for that. Because now we can have confidence in you to know that nothing passes your sight, nothing passes your mind. We don't serve a deist God but we serve a God who is intricately involved in the affairs of humanity. And so I pray for every single believer that may be going through something. And I know there are some going through something, family issues, health issues, economic issues, whatever the issues may be, interpersonal issues, personal issues. My prayer, God, spiritual issues, my prayer is that they will understand the throne room trailer. And no, Lord, the day is coming when we will all be in heaven. That day is not today, but it's coming. When we will all be in heaven, around the throne, in the throne room, celebrating and praising you like never before. And my prayer is that each one of us will get our ticket and get on board of that train and be a part of that experience when that day comes. Be with us now, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. May his face continuously shine upon you and go in peace. See you 4 p.m. today, amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. Today's benediction comes from Psalms 134. Now bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand in the Lord's house at night. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Let's pray. Lord, we glorify and magnify you. You are our King, our God, and we worship you. Though we are not able to be together physically, Father God, that does not change the love that we have for one another and for you. It is unusual times, hard times, but what does not change is you, Father. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.